Lars, welcome. Hello. Good night, I suppose I should say. <laughs> yeah, we're in a weird time situation right now. We're just going for it. So, uh, you know, it's the middle of the day for you there right now. Uh, thank you so uh, much for calling in. Yeah, 1030 in the morning. 1030. OK, so still pretty early. Um, yeah. On a Sunday, we really appreciate you calling in. And everyone, I have to say, you know, we gave Lars a choice of any of the interview slots in this last session. And he said, you know, I'll take that one because it seems like it'll be the hardest for anyone who's on the East Coast to do. So <laughs> that was a really thoughtful, you know, uh, comment. So we're glad to have you. Thank you so much for calling in. Thank you. Um, and I want to talk about this. So your mm -hmm. new book, uh, sort of the culmination of the blogging that you've been doing over the last, you know, what has it been, six years? Ten. Uh, ten. Wow. Yeah. Um, so really a game changer. Totally, you know, sort of upends a lot of what we think we know about brewing. And before we get into anything, I want to start with one of the scenes from the book where uh, you're in Russia with your translator, Alexander Garmov, uh, Gromov, and uh, he is speaking with this Russian family, and they start going back and forth in a really heated debate and discussion, and then he turns to you and just exclaims, they boil the mash! <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty typical. So that's sort of like the level of what we're dealing with here. You know, we have these typical standards of what brewing is, but, um, you know, sort of the things you've discovered that people are doing as far as boiling the mash, fermenting the mash, uh, doing no boils, using hot stones, all sorts of things. It's really, um, you know, cool to see these new historical techniques come out and learn a lot more about them. So. Uh, great book, and <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so why don't we start with uh, your definition of what farmhouse brewing is? Because I think you know we definitely have different concepts of that. Of we see farmhouse ale thrown on a lot of different labels, just if it's a saison or if it's a Brett beer or anything like that. So what does farmhouse brewing mean to you? Well, um, it used to be simpler than it is. So originally, people grew their own grain, and then they malted it and they brewed from it in, in the local tradition of brewing where they lived. Uh, but that's kind of uh, died out a little bit. Mostly people buy the malts now, for example. You know, they might be a school teacher or something like that, so they don't have grain. Um, but if they still brew in the same tradition, you know, they learn from somebody else who learned from somebody else and it comes out of that tradition, then it's farmhouse brewing to me. But it's all, uh, the, the first question I ask in an interview is always the same one. Who did you learn brewing from and when? Well, that's how you can tell their connection to the tradition. And how much do you see in, the, in your interviews as far as so they learned it from a specific person, they learned the tradition, how much have people stuck to that exact tradition and how much have they been like, well, you know, that's the way I was taught, but there's some wiggle room here so I could do this a little bit and do that a little bit differently. Uh, it, it varies. Um, in general, they tend to stick to it very exactly um, because and part of the reason is they don't know any brewing science. So uh, if you try something, it's more or less at random. So some people have, have um, uh, Svaitis Grindo, for example, he, he increased the fermentation temperature because he felt it was, uh, it was hard to get the yeast started. And he thought, well, in the old days, I think it was warmer than what my dad taught me. And then he went up a little bit. Um, so there, there are things like that. And, um, some people have originally had smoked malts. There was a family in, in Hardanger in Western Norway. And their grandpa, he, uh, he, uh, when they didn't make the malts anymore, he would hang the malt sack in the chimney. 
to get the, the get it smoked basically just to get a little smoke aroma but his his uh, grandsons they clearly don't like smoke aroma so they hang one juniper branch there and then they put that in the kettle and say, ah, yeah, now we have smoke flavor. <laughs> it, se it seems to be just like, okay, we're, now we can pretend we're following the tradition, but really we changed it. I see. Yeah, I was, because uh, early in the book, you mentioned uh, you're brewing with Carlo all, and he tells a story. Well, you, he's splitting the juniper branches lengthwise, and you ask him why he does that. And he yep. says, you know, I don't know. And after a pause, after a while, then he's, he tells a story of how his mother, when, he was, when she was teaching him how to cook pork, you know, you have to chop the pork a certain way. Why do you do that? Oh, that's the way your grandmother taught me. And eventually he asks his grandma why she cut the porks like that. And the response was, well, our oven was too narrow. So I thought yeah. that was a really, you know, insightful message of you know of course um we want to retain all these traditions and this history but sometimes you know certain things don't make sense might, yeah yeah they might not necessarily have to be done exactly the same way so um there could be some room for interpretation or reinvention a little bit yeah there, there is and there's been changes to equipment and so on um but generally people try to stay quite close so even when they for example switch from having um, wooden louter tons to metal ones they stick with the same shape that's been traditional so the there was a uh, a finnish a very small company that made metal louter tons and they still made them in this canoe like shape with the hole at the end and and stuck exactly to the way it was they just changed the material of course they could have made any shape at all but no nope. wow yeah so they stuck with a is it kuruna 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 yeah 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 um so really interesting to see sort of the division too by region as far as what was popular for yeah. different setups and everything um and you know so modern commercial brews are typically <clears throat> excuse me, categorized into either broadly ales or lagers. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you take a little bit different look as, as far as focusing more on uh, the process and the malt. Uh, so how did you decide to organize the farmhouse ales like that? And how much research did you have to do for that pattern to become apparent that that was the most logical categorization for them uh that actually the categorizing the brewing processes took i don't know three or four years i think i was yeah maybe i was even making changes toward the end so maybe five years almost um so i started out with the the answers to the norwegian um ethnographic questionnaire on, on farmhouse brewing which is 1200 handwritten pages from 180 different people and i was reading that and it, and it was just okay so so he says it's like this okay great you turn uh, turn to the next place what the but this is different and then the next one is like oh but this what what and uh, <laughs> there's a hundred and what is it there's 103 questions in the questionnaire so there there's just so much data and that's why i started building this database which is where all the maps and and stuff comes from and the brewing processes was the hardest bit to get a handle on uh that took that took me a long time to kind of i started out just making a number for each new process that i saw okay this is number 12 this is number 27 and then eventually I started grouping those and that's when I started to kind of, okay, now I'm beginning to get some sort of handle on this. But it, yeah, but it was, it was actually quite late in the game that I realized that originally I thought, do you boil the wort? Do you not boil the wort? That that was the most important thing. Uh, but getting more data, I started to see that no, it's actually about coming up with different strategies for doing the mash. Um, which used to be a difficult technical problem. 
just being able to heat it without the without the metal container. Yeah, absolutely. So starting mostly from heated stones in the earliest times when we didn't have you know big kettles to use to heat things. Um, I really enjoyed. Um, it was Dimitri in Russia with the Korchaga and just putting that in the oven. Like, I love the simplicity of that so much. I think that's great. And, you know, with the straw and everything already at the bottom of the container. So once you're done oven mashing, you could just open it up, filter it out through that container that you mashed in and go into the boil, um, you know, or potentially even not even do a boil. So that was uh, yeah. really fun to see. I, I think that's, uh, you know, interesting way to approach. I feel like as home brewers, we're always trying to simplify things and, um, but we also always try to do new processes. Like in our home brewing club, we do a lot of experiments. So we've done some side-by-sides where we're comparing decoction mashing to adding uh, some melanoidin malt into your grain bill and found out that really there's no discernible benefit to doing decoction, but of course we still have people who will decoct just for the sake of decocting because it's fun. It's fun to try a new method and to learn those historical techniques. So I feel like even though it's um, more labor intensive and painful to heat up stones or to make your own malt, I feel like that really appeals to a lot of people um, as far as being able to see the whole process through from start to finish and keep those historical traditions alive. Yeah, the, the making your own malts actually does make a big difference. Um, so in the, uh, at the Farmhouse Ale Festival where some people make their own malts, uh, but most don't. The, the people who make their own malts are almost always ahead because it's it just gives so much more depth of flavor because you don't have the you don't have the detailed control over both the germination and the drying that you do commercially so it's, it just it gives more flavor it gives more character yeah and you so you have a whole chapter dedicated to malting with all the different techniques from smoky low smoke no smoke yeah. high heat low heat so we sort of get a range and it's really you know inspiring to see all the different methods that we could potentially do i think in new york city we're a little limited with what we could grow and what space we have but you know maybe a day off in the country or something uh, it'd be fun to implement those and i was yeah, excited I, to see oh go ahead I, yeah, I think i think the bigger buildings might be difficult to do in a new york city apartment like the ones with two stories and so on. Yeah. <laughs> My landlord would be really mad at me, I think, if I tried to, <laughs> you know, burn yeah, the whole that's... building down trying to smoke some malt. Um, uh, I was excited to see the use of saunas to yeah. kill the malt because um, I've always wondered about that as far as, you know, sort of similar processes and you know it makes sense to have multi-uses for a single building um and i'm i'm a big fan of going to the sauna i have a russian bathhouse a banya just down the street from me and i always thought a brewery would be cool as far as like the steam from the kettle goes to the steam room and then the heat from the sauna yeah. heats the mash something like that so i don't know mm -hmm. if you've encountered any different uh setups like that or is it just the sauna is just used for malting um this the sauna was a, as a multi-use room or house so it would be used as a sauna um and in, in Finland, for example, it was common to give birth in there because it was a, it was a warm and very clean room. Um, it was also used for the drying linen, drying the grain. Um, in, in Northern Europe, when you harvest the grain, uh, it's not dry enough that you can store it. So it has to go through a, a process of drying. Um, people also dried like meat and fish in the sauna. And the, or smoked it depending on what they wanted. So uh, in fact, a lot of these old Norwegian, uh, we call them bastu, but it's roughly the same as the Finnish sauna. Uh, a, a lot of those that still exist are still used for smoking uh, meat and fish, actually. Oh, wow. interesting. But the the, the combining the the brewing and the and the sauna and exchanging the heat in that way is 
it's tricky when you when you have you know this really primitive technology no metal pipes and stuff like that it becomes too difficult yeah i'm sure it would be difficult so it's a it's a pipe dream one day i'll uh, build something yeah. like that maybe. uh so juniper figures pretty prominently in a lot of the recipes as far as using juniper uh to sterilize the cleaning equipment or to help clean the cleaning sorry to help clean the brewing equipment um, as well as providing flavor and bitterness to help balance the sweetness of the beer so using just a very low amount of hops if any at all um, just for some antimicrobial effect and then relying on the juniper to uh, provide the balance that most beers need so i'm just curious about sort of the overall use of juniper in Norway and uh, mm -hmm. the Scandinavian countries as far as if it's just um, figures this prominently only in brewing or if it's also similarly highly valued and used frequently for other applications. Um, one of the Norwegian ethnobotanists uh, described it as the, uh, the most useful wild plant in Norway. So uh, the, like the, uh, how do I say this? The most prominent Norwegian ethnobotanist spent his whole life collecting um, information about how to use various plants. He, he published this giant book at the end of his life. And then once he'd done that big book, he did another book, which was just about juniper. And he, uh, I think he spent 50 pages going through the different uses of juniper. Wow, and impressive. So, <laughs> so he, it was used for uh, you know, anything that you made from wood that needed to last a long time. If it wasn't too big, juniper was good for that. But they also used juniper branches uh, to cover the outside of a wall if it was, it was very exposed to the weather. Really, the, the branches with the needles and everything. But uh, juniper is very resistant to rot, so it would it would actually last a very long time. Um, it was used to you know you ha you would hack it up and strew it across the floor to get a nice smell in the house. Uh, you would make juniper infusion to wash your hair. Uh, to wash equipment, you know, dairy equipment, this kind of thing. A little, used for fence poles, if you wanted the fence to last a long time, it just goes on and on and on and on. It's incredible, actually. Yeah, and it's fairly common, so it would be easy enough for brewers to get access to, to use as uh, yeah. sort of the false bottom in their water tons. And I think actually it was probably easier to find before because um, they had the animals that would, you know, graze down all the ve vegetation, uh, but they wouldn't eat juniper for <laughs> fairly obvious reasons. Um, so the juniper would often be, you know, be standing alone in the fields and the farmers would leave them until they grew big enough and, you know, they would plan, okay, I'm going to use this one for this or... So they, they had ready access to it, yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, all right. And so... Viewers, if you have any questions for Lars, feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A window. You could also raise your hand and we'll take a question over uh, audio. So feel free to do that throughout the interview whenever you have a question that comes to mind. Um, all right. So how big is farmhouse brewing becoming as a tourist attraction? That's a very good question. Um... Uh, we do see people coming to Norway every year, every summer asking, you know, where do I find Quake beers? Where can I find farmhouse ale? Uh, and mostly being quite disappointed. Um, so there are a good number of people that come to the farmhouse ale festival every year. Um, and there's, uh, there's some traffic of commercial brewers really coming to do study tours. It's not huge, but it does happen. And, there is, there is one guy, one of the farmhouse brewers started uh, what he calls uh, quake training. I think he did the two weekends where participants came from, there were people from New Zealand that, that flew there just to, you know, go through the whole brew day, taste different beers, learn how to brew them and, and then go home again. Um, I think it's going to grow. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that the ordinary tourist industry hasn't seen the potential in this because I think Let's say that you have a bunch of people coming off a cruise ship, which happens, you know, by the tens of thousands every summer. 
Um, if you offered them to sit in one of these old smokehouses with the fire and drink traditional beer from a, a wooden bowl with horse head handles and, you know, here you boil some juniper infusion and tell them about the crike, I think a lot of people would be interested. Absolutely. And I think in your book, you make it clear that, you know, we could talk about these beers, you could give us some recipes to use as guidelines, but really until you have one of the actual beers and see the process, you know, you're not necessarily drinking or brewing a farmhouse ale. So I think it's really a good opportunity for some in-person visits. I would definitely love to go to a lot of these places and, you know, just try try some of the beers. So I think um, you know if the local economies are up for it, and if there's brewers who who are up for it, it could definitely become a, a big industry. There are people. There's one guy in Voss who's thinking about setting up something commercial as well. Uh, the timing isn't great for him at the moment, but uh, but uh, there are signs the stuff is happening. So yeah, this could be uh, this could definitely be becoming bigger. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's talk about Kvike a little bit. So that, you know, has really revolutionized the brewing industry, both commercial and for home brewers. Uh, for those attendees who don't know, Kvike is a yeast that you could use at high temperatures. It ferments super quickly and that allows production breweries to just turn around beers in you know half the time of what they had previously done so it you know you could produce essentially twice as much beer on the same system that you had been using so it's really wild the impact that this has had um and you know there's a wide range of flavors and aromas that come with these so it's not like you're just locked into making one specific beer with it, you can make a wide array of styles. Um, and then for home brewers, I feel like it's made things a lot more accessible because when I started home brewing 10 years ago, it was like, if you don't have temperature control, you use Cezanne yeast and Cezanne is such a particular character. Yeah. It's gonna taste like a Cezanne, no matter what your malt bill is, no matter what hops you use. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, so now, you know, home brewers have a lot more flexibility in what they could brew uh, just any time of the year. So could you provide like a little background as far as how these yeasts came from these small farms to now being available in commercial labs and available to home brewers? Yeah, it was the uh, mainly, I think, the trip that we did in, in 2014 when we collected Craig uh, from Sigmund Yarnes. I was really excited about this yeast for basically for the reasons you outlined, um, and and we just shared it with everybody that I could. And I think thanks to the blog post, uh, it received a good amount of attention. So this was the blog post about brewing uh, with Sigmund. That blog post actually gets more views every year. <laughs> so 2015, wow. you had more views than in 2014, and then it's just been going up. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure as more and more people are learning about it. And I, I think the, the the fact that it was a so so relatively easy to get hold of, it meant that all of these insane things that we were claiming about it, uh, people could try it for themselves, and they could see that yeah, okay, it does work. It sounds incredible, but it does work. And then also getting the the first lab results showing that it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's three strains, there's no bacteria. That also helped people get uh, kind of a, oh, okay, so it is real and it's, it's, it's decent stuff. Um, and then it just took off from there. Like it's, it's kind of weird. You send this thing out in the world and you keep hearing more and more and more amazing things to happen, but the yeast did most of it on its own once it got out there. Yeah. And in the book, you make it pretty clear that in a farmhouse tradition, people would never charge someone money for yeast. It was always freely given or traded. You know, if you ran out of yeast, if yours went bad or something, you could just go to a neighbor and get some of their yeast. Um, in one case, I think the the brewers were required by law to give bakeries yeast for free. Um, so it hasn't really been... Uh, 
a commodity that people have used for traded with money really yeah as brett says in the chat like a sourdough starter definitely yeah. people trading it um and now you know i'm really glad that we have such widely available access to these yeasts but i just wonder how the farms feel about uh like these labs charging for it and making a profit off this yeast that they just gave away for free or if uh, they have any compensation at all uh, uh, there is one brewer who gets compensation. Uh, that's uh, Aldona Udriene at uh, Yuvaru Alus in Lithuania. She has a commercial brewery, and so we. It was it was possible to collect her uh, her yeast, of course, but we we've, I never shared it. We sent it to to analyzers, but nothing else. Uh, and sh but she eventually set up a deal with Omega Yeast Labs in Chicago, and they actually pay her. Um, I don't know how much, but they have they have a commercial agreement where they license the yeast from her, so she gets paid. But uh, nobody else that I know of. Um, generally, they seem to be very happy about it. They're proud that that um, their yeast is you know doesn't just get a stamp of approval, but it's considered good enough to be sold as a commercial product on a, an equal footing with the yeast that comes from you know the big established breweries. So, so far they've, they've been happy about it. There are some yeah, people who, who say they don't want it sold and then, okay, then we don't do it. We don't share it. Yeah, it seems like there's a big tradition also of um, having pride in your brewing product as far as having stronger beers and having enough beer for certain holidays and celebrations so i could see yeah. having pride that you know it's gotten that big to go out to all these different people and being used in commercial breweries it, and everything yeah i i want to tell a story about that we we at the last farmhouse dale festival um a woman who was a brewmaster at the biggest industrial brewery, kind of the Norwegian Budweiser. Uh, she was there and she's, you know, just as a, to learn about Norwegian beer, I guess. And uh, on the second day, she was, she was coming over to me just to say, you know, oh, this was great to trying all these beers and it's been amazing. But I, I was being interviewed by the local newspaper at the time. So I, <laughs> I pointed to her and said, okay, tell this guy who you are and, and you know, what you think of this. And she, uh, she literally got tears in her eyes when she was saying, you know, the amount of pride that these people put into their beer and, you know, the love and care and attention and, and uh, uh, she almost couldn't finish her sentence. And, that, uh, and it's, they invest a lot of themselves in this beer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. And I could only imagine as far as the amount of effort that it goes into uh, yeah. to produce it and maintain everything throughout and um, it's really cool so thank you very much for bringing this all to light uh, everyone please get this book read it it's amazing um, you know I think the blog Lars blog is also accessible um, but the book is sort of a nice collection of everything condensed all into one um, really nicely told format with beer history, uh, some anthropology, archaeology, as well as this, you know, hardcore like brewing outline processes as far as like how you could make your own malts um, to everything. So, uh, and okay, we have one chat, one question in the Q&A. Have any of the traditional brewers gotten to try a commercial beer made with their, like, or maybe even their farmhouse yeast, like the Yover? Uh, yeah, some of them have. Um, one of them, <laughs> Stein Longlo, who's uh, briefly mentioned in the book, even uh, found in, in the wine monopoly, the local uh, you know, a beer store, a beer with his name on it. <laughs> so he bought it and took it home and posted on Facebook, like, what is this? <laughs> that, was, that was an IPA made with the uh, almost dead quake that he, he gave to me and that I you know, sent out. Uh, so, and he was kind of surprised. Like, why didn't they tell me? Which I think is fair. I, it's not an unreasonable reaction, but he, he didn't seem upset or anything. Um, and there's also one brewer who set up, um, set up a kind of gypsy brewery, as they call it, where you don't have a physical plant uh, and got the proof in uh, Belgium 
to brew a replica of his corn, a raw ale with with Vike. They don't have juniper enough for it in Belgium, so they had to skip that. But uh, otherwise, they've tried to make it fairly close to the original. <laughs> have you tried that one? Has it come close yeah, yeah. to the original? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, they um, carbonated it because they're Belgians. Uh, they also filtered it because, and this, this is kind of wild to me, so uh, the brewer, you know, these brewers say, okay, so this beer is raw, so you no boil. Okay, says the proof, uh, totally fine, but we have to filter it. But, but, but it's not supposed to be filtered, and you know, when you don't boil, you leave all these proteins and stuff in there, so when you filter it, you kind of lose some of the point of not boiling it. But mm -hmm. no, it has to be filtered. <laughs> <laughs> the Belgian brewing tradition is also very strong and you know, yeah there was a cultural here. collision there yeah <laughs> oh, yeah it's really cool though and there are some recipes in here um, sort of recipe guidelines because you know sometimes it's not always clear what yeast were used or what the hops were um, if even hops were used but I'm really inspired. I definitely want to try making some raw ales and some keptinis. That's really yeah. cool, the baked mash. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, it should be a lot of fun and there's a lot of good, good brewing to try in here. So thank right. you very much for your work that you've done and thank you for coming on here today to chat with all of us. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for having it. me. Yeah, thank okay. you for your time. Thank you, bye. Bye. And we're going to go back and bring in our brewers. So uh, Scott Ofterhide, Scotty G, Ariel, and Bert, and Julius, if you want to come back online, uh, we'll check in with our brewers. <laughs> 